I love farming. My background is farming. I grew up growing cotton and millet and rice. When I came here ten, over 10 years ago, we have only two Korean people in Minnesota. Now we have uh, 8,000 Korean people in Minnesota. All of you contribute so much for this country so far. And now we are going back to farm for Minnesota, for this country. A planning committee asked Senator Klobuchar, who is a senator from Minnesota, to, to speak at our conference this year, and she was unable to because of other things. Um, but she sent a video. They, they presented a video. Um, and it is addressing our conference, and I would like to show that video now. Hello to all my friends taking part in this year's Immigrant and Minority Farmers Conference. I know you have interpreters there, and so I will try to speak a little slower than I usually do. I seem to talk faster than most Minnesotans, uh, so you have a chance to translate. I think you know I would much rather be there with you in person, but there's a few things going on around the state right now, and so I am honored to join you via video. I know you have a fantastic group of farmers and agriculture leaders there today, and I want to begin by thanking you for everything you do to keep Minnesota's food and farm sector strong. No matter where I go in our state, I'm reminded of the critical role that agriculture plays in our economy. This is Minnesota's leading export, accounting for $75 billion in economic activity every year and supporting more than 300,000 jobs. So whether it's growing the crops or raising the livestock or powering our homegrown energy, you are doing some of the most important work out there, work that feeds our families and keeps our economy moving forward. Just as importantly, you are part of a long tradition of immigrants playing a key role in our state's industry. Minnesota is home to one of the most vibrant and dynamic immigrant communities in the nation, and I'm proud to represent a state with, for instance, the largest Somali population in the U.S., the second largest community of Hmong immigrants, a very strong Latino community just all across our state. As you know, the President recently came out in support of comprehensive immigration reform. I support comprehensive immigration reform, I always have, and I'm currently working in the Senate to update and improve our immigration laws. I'm working on the Judiciary Committee, and I already have a bipartisan bill that would increase the number of green cards and H-1B work visas available. But there's obviously more we do, more we need to do, and I'm looking so forward to working with the immigrant community and getting the strongest immigration reform we can. Regardless of where our immigrants come from, Minnesota is making, in Minnesota, you are making significant contributions to our culture and our economy. In the Twin Cities alone, 11% of small businesses are now owned by immigrants. And we don't, don't need to look any further than your conference today to see the incredible impact that immigrants and minorities are having in Minnesota agriculture. I know that half of your audience is made up of women farmers, so I especially want to highlight the trends we're seeing for women in this industry. Women are now the largest minority group in farming and the fastest growing. In fact, the most recent data from the U.S. Department of Agriculture shows that the number of women farm operators jumped 30 percent between 2002 and 2007. I've always believed that the strength of our state is anchored in the diversity of our people, and Minnesota's agriculture sector is no exception. But in order to keep our farm economy strong, we need clear and consistent policies that give our farmers the certainty and stability that you need to move forward. As a member of the Senate Agriculture Committee, I worked to make sure the Senate passed a strong 2012 Farm Bill that strengthens the crop insurance program, eliminates direct payments, tended to much more go to the large farmers, and I think that's been very important, and also uh, come with it $23 billion in cuts that we made the decision on how to do them in the Agriculture Committee. I'd also add that it includes a strong energy title. 
the Senate passed Farm Bill included legislation I'd introduced to help more beginning farmers and ranchers get off the ground. There are real opportunities for people to get a start in farming these days, especially in growing areas like organic farming and renewable energy. But as you know, beginning farmers also face some significant obstacles, not least of all, high land prices and limited access to critical resources like credit and technical assistance. Unfortunately, despite the leadership and strong work of Colin Peterson and Tim Walls and others, the House failed to act and pass the 2012 Farm Bill. And while the fiscal cliff deal extended certain provisions of the 2008 Farm Bill through September 30th, including commodity programs and crop insurance, it is a stopgap solution that cannot replace the value of a five-year Farm Bill. Like you, I was frustrated and disappointed that the extension failed to fund a number of core provisions, including the entire energy title. It also fails to incorporate many of the important changes we made in the Senate, like assistance for organic producers and my amendment to help beginning farmers and ranchers. So there is still more to do, but I am committed to working with you and the rest of Minnesota's agriculture community to make sure we pass a strong five-year farm bill in 2013. My priorities will include strengthening the farm safety net, investing in the production and development of renewable energy production, and making it possible for the next generation of farmers and ranchers to get a start in agriculture. When we look at the economic turmoil of the last few years, we know that America can no longer afford to be a country that just churns money around on Wall Street. What we need to be now is a country that thinks, that invents, that makes things, that exports to the world. This is the kind of work you do every day. Work with real and measurable benefits for our country and our economy. Work that means something. Thank you again for everything you do to keep Minnesota's agriculture sector strong. Have a great time today and keep up the good work. Thank you. We are very honored to have Maria Moreira here today. She came all the way from Massachusetts along with a group of her farmer colleagues. Yep, there you are, you guys are yeah, all right. And uh, I'm gonna let Maria introduce a little bit about herself, but I will say briefly that she is a farmer, a dairy farmer. She has worked with Extension Services. She has, uh, some of you may have received notice about serving on a county FSA committee. We get these notices and we share with farmers, you can serve on a county FSA committee. Maria has done it for nine years. How about that? Um, she has worked with NRCS on their equip program for hoop houses, am I correct? And she is, she's, she's very adept at connecting programs and assisting farmers. And she operates Flats Mentor Farm. I met her a number of years ago, um, I think initially through NIFI, the National Immigrant Farming Initiative. We both served on the board of directors there. So without further ado, Maria. I'm gonna get you set up here. Welcome, and this is really an honor uh, for me to be here. Um, when Glenn first contacted me and I said, are you sure you want me to do this? Um, so it's really an honor um, to be a keynote speaker today. Um, I, I, I'm just amazed. I know I'm in good company when I have seeds in my packet. <laughs> this is a real farmer conference when, when I have seeds. Well, uh, I understand yesterday that uh, some of you shared your stories and I am so sorry I couldn't be here to, to share, to actually um, see you sharing the stories. Um, and today, um, I'm gonna share my story with you. Um, I, like Lynn said, I, I'm a, a dairy farmer, a former dairy farmer, and um, I am going to, pr to show you a presentation today that um, probably doesn't touch on a few things that I have, that I'm, um, uh, have been working on over the years, and that is um, um, participating in um, 
USDA farmer programs, and also participating in, in, in farmer advocacy, um, because I know how it feels to not speak, be able to speak English. I know exactly how it feels. I lost half of the teeth in my back of my mouth because my parents couldn't speak English, so I know exactly how it feels. Um, <laughs> so um, today I'm going to show, I'm going to share uh, my story, and I love to use pictures. Um, a picture says a thousand words, and sometimes I, we can't explain um, anything that we do um, if we don't show a picture. In a, in, you don't need, you don't need the, the language. So any language, um, a, a picture just explains everything. <clears throat> so um, I'd like to give you a little bit of my background. Um, I came to the United States um, 46 years ago. I came as a very young girl. Um, I was um, 12. Uh, then, um, we come from agrarian backgrounds, small subsistence farmers. My parents were uh, subsistence farmers back in the Azores, where, I, where I'm from. And um, I also married someone who's from the same place that I am. And um, our love of farming um, just, you know, trumped everything in every every um, way of, of life and um, also uh, every rationale. So you can really, um, when you love farming, you can make a lot of excuses, you know, to keep on farming. So um, uh, I made cheese for over 20 years and I've been sharing um, my land with the Hmong and the African farmers for over 30 years. Uh, we own 140 acres and we rent land. Uh, in 1984, we milked 80 cows. In 2004, when we sold the cows, um, we were milking 200. The reason why we sold the cows is because the children went, went off to college. So. Um, because of, of the dairy farm the way it was, uh, we needed the labor and um, the labor went off to college. So, so, but I did continue to make cheese and we also sold that in 2006 and um, I decided to turn another leaf which was to really drew, see um, what true farmer advocacy is. Um, and I had the opportunity to do it. And, um, and so I'm gonna explain to you what I do, and I know you guys can do it better. I really do know you guys can do it better. Um, before I, 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 that was a little bit of my background. Before I start, can all of the farmers here in this room stand up? I just wanna see how many farmers are in this room. All farmers. Can the farmers stand up? Farmers. Wow. Farmers. Wow, great. What about immigrants? All the immigrants stand up. <laughs> great. Now I know I am in the right prep place. <laughs> okay, why well, tell you about me? Because if I can do something, and I haven't done anything special, but I know you can do it better. Um, back when I was starting, you know, um, I thought that being a dairy farmer, I was really having a hard time financially, a really hard time. And I couldn't see the way, what was I going to do to, to stay farming? 
quit farming was not an option. I had already uh, made too many other decisions, including having four children and making sure that I had made a decision, my husband and I, that we were going to be farmers. Nobody told me it was going to be this hard. <laughs> so um, what, I, what we did, and basically what I did is every day, I, I actually looked around and said, okay, how can I make this work? How can I make this work? It's got to work. So I, I went through a, 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 my own self-assessment, and I want to share that self-assessment with you. It's something I thought about over time, and I thought about how, how can I make farming work for me? And, and so, uh, um, I, and I say, do I have a purpose? Yes, I did. I had a purpose. Mine was to raise our four kids on the farm. That was a purpose, a real one, okay? And then I looked around, and, and I think you guys, everybody can do that. You know, and say, okay, what do I already have? Do, you know, you have something special. I know sometimes it's very hard to find, but we all have something special within us that we can do. In my case, I had lots and lots of milk that nobody was paying me the cost, uh, even the cost of production. And if anyone knows about dairy farming, it's extremely difficult and a lot of the farmers aren't getting paid the cost of production. So um, I developed a value-added product, which was cheese, okay? And a lot of people said, why did you do that? How did you come up with that idea? Wow, it's a wonderful idea. And uh, what I said was, when you have four children and you have made a decision to stay farming, it was necessity. It wasn't some wow, wonderful, th it was just plain old necessity. And here's what I did. What can I make with milk to add income to my family operation? Okay? And I, I, I looked around, basically. Um, and I also, I was already making that cheese. My grandmother made it. My mother made it at home, and we loved it. So I said, well, if we like to eat it, my friends like to eat it, maybe someone will also like to eat it, and I can make some money from it. And that's how I literally um, started the cheese business. I also took several steps into evaluating the opportunities. Okay, and, and, and so I, I decided to make the cheese. And these are the steps that anyone can, anyone can take a look at these steps, no matter how small or how large you are. Um, if you go through these steps in your head, I know that there's a lot of trainings on business planning and putting things down on paper. And um, I, sometimes I've done a little bit of the putting down on paper, but sometimes the paper is not too strong and I lose it. But the thing is that you definitely have to have it inside you. You have to have thought about it and thought about it a lot. Okay, you, you evaluate how much, the, how much the cost to produce whatever it is that you're doing. And do people want to buy it? And this is what you call market evaluation. The, the, that's a, just a fancy name for it, but um, that's all it is. Um, you also... You look at the market and you say, in my case, I had to look and say, okay, is this cheese already being produced in the market? And it was. Somebody, someone was already producing the same type of cheese. They were selling it. But what I thought was, I can do it better. I know I can introduce my special cheese to the same market, and I know I can do it better. I, and, and I did. I literally went into the market. Mine looked was a little bit bigger, but mine was a lot more expensive, and it sold with a lot of work. So, so the thing is that you, you find out who wants to buy what you're producing. If it is vegetables, if it's, if me, in my case, was cheese,
But I've also, you know, towards the end of this presentation, I'll show you what I've, I've been working with the Hmong for almost 30 years, and I'm now working with African farmers and, and assisting. We, we're also developing a, a cooperative marketing. Um, I love to do marketing, and, uh, but it's very, very important that you assess where you're going to sell your vegetables, who is going to buy it, who's going to buy what you produce, in how you present those things that you're, gonna, that you're gonna sell. Okay, so the difference between what it costs to produce, when you evaluate it, the difference between what it costs to produce and what the customer will pay, that's what you take home. That's your profit. And then you have to say, wow, is it worth it? Is it worth, the, uh, is it paying for me for my time to produce whatever it is that I'm producing? You can put a fancy, you can put all of this information in a very, very fancy piece of paper, or you can take a plain piece of paper at home and actually do the figures yourself and actually feel it. You have to know because you're the one that's going to go out there. You're the, you're the one that, that is planting, that is, that is weeding, that is watering, that is harvesting. It's very, very hard. So you have to, and also some farmers tend not to think that their time is worth money, but it is. Okay, <laughs> and what I touched upon was the three steps to succeed in farming. For me, it's been marketing, marketing, marketing. Okay, <laughs> and marketing means, means you, 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 pres you produce a product that you have looked in the market to see if somebody will buy it, and you produce the best quality product that you can. And this is the cheese that I was talking, to, talking with you about. I developed it. Um, this is th this is how it how how it went on the on the package the box. I developed everything from the late from the cheese from the packaging, the label. I even designed the the styrofoam box that it went into. Packaging is very 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 important. So the label. <coughs> You need to work with your state and your reg and regulatory agencies to make sure that it conforms to all of the state regulations. Um, I'm going to give you a quick, a quick um, a story about the way it's half. It's, ha it's half moon. Ha and this happened because uh, when I went to the label maker, um, they wanted to charge me three cents per label, and I couldn't afford that. So I said, you don't charge me for extra ink. Let me see. If I make it half of a circle, I get two labels for one, and thus I, I got half of the circle. It was all to save money, and, I, and, I, and it was a, a 1.5 pennies per label instead of three. That's, so people say, wow, you came up with that design? Again, design was a necessity. Also the packaging. Pay close attention to aesthetics. Pay close, pay close attention to the way it looks. Because people buy with their eyes. You know, the, you know the product is really good. You made it it's really, really good. But people buy with their eyes. It needs to be clean. It needs to look beautiful, as beautiful as you can. And also, it can say, you know, it's OK for it to say something about you about your culture, celebrate who you are. Celebrate it because it, it's, it's good. Okay, the transportation also, you have, you have to be careful um, how you're gonna get the product to the market. If it's a perishable product, you have to put it on the refrigeration so that way it stays fresh. All right, <laughs> so this is, believe it or not, let me see if I can, uh, can you see the mouse on that? Oh yeah, you can, good. All right, but this was me a long time ago. <laughs> and now um, she's 32 and he's 35 and he's 30. <laughs> so, and <clears throat> this was back on, on 1988. And I was telling my story then so it's very, very important for, for, 
all of you, if you have a product, if you're trying to market your product, you know, tell, tell the newspapers that you're, that you're taking your products to Whole Foods or to, or to a market that will pay you a premium. It's okay, you know? And, and so I was doing that back in 19, um, 1988. Um, 1998, 10 years later, um, I, again, now this was in a newspaper, and also be very, very careful on when you actually um, talk to newspapers because that picture um, was there because I said to, to the Boston Globe, I said, you know, I really don't like my, my face in the paper. Could you, you can, you can take the cheese, but you can't take my face. <laughs> and so. Uh, when, and he said, oh, no, no, it's going to be the cheese. Why don't, you, why don't you hold the cheese in front of your face? <laughs> so that's how come my face was, in, you know, my, there's the cheese, but my face is still there. But, it, 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 you know, we had a whole, a whole um, um, article on us, a full page. It was good. It was good. I was, I just, you know, <clears throat> this was part of, they did the whole, a whole story. Again, this got, in that, this was 10 years later. This got us into a lot of different other markets because my main market was the Portuguese market. And this got me into the, the American market or the mainstream market. And it was very, very good for our business. Okay, and I also did promotion. Again, marketing. Marketing, 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 in-store promotions with with um, the the store managers, and you pre you're presenting your product, tastings, and all of that wonderful stuff. All right, that was a little bit of what I've done. Um, now, uh, as my other hat as mentor farmer, why? There was a need. I had the capacity to help. It gave me a sense of satisfaction. Giving feels a lot better than receiving. All right, so this was back in um, actually, this was in uh, I think it was um, eighty six. Do any of you know Gus Schumacher? Yeah, there's a few. <laughs> Um, Gus was commissioner of agriculture way back when, and, and I was making cheese, and this is, this is me um, when I started the cheese business a long time ago. Um, but back in 1984, I, be, I began working with, uh, with farmers in Lancaster, and mainly with Hmong farmers. And it took from 1984 to 1988 for anybody to know that we were there. So no one knew that we were there. You know, they, the farmers would come every year. They do their plots. Uh, they would pay to have it harrowed, put, put uh, uh, compost on the land, and they'd go and, and we'd, we'd, we'd you know, I was dairy farming and making cheese and they were growing vegetables. One of the things that I had identified many, many times was the need for marketing. I'll never forget, I, I one, one year um, there was a, a friend who, who's now passed, uh, Chai Yang, who came to me and he said, they kicked me out of the flea market because I look the way I do. And, and, and I knew I knew that, that that was happening. I just could not do anything about it at that time. Couldn't do it. There was numerous other, other happenings, things that were happening that I, that I heard through that time, and I couldn't do anything about it. But I never forgot it because half of my mouth was missing the teeth. <laughs> and, I knew, and I knew what had happened to me too, and that, that's what drove me. So uh, anyway, um, but in 1998, um, all of a sudden, USDA um, recognized, because of, because of uh, the beginning farmer, it was a, a different farm bill, and now they were recognizing uh, beginning farmers. 
Okay, so um, USDA recognized us as a model for all beginning farming uh, projects in the country. And, they, and the, the state came and they looked and, you know, um, they, they wanted to help, okay? So the, far, the flats meant to farm have been, it's been in its existence since about 1985. It's located on 70 acres of land. Uh, beginning farmers have been here since the 80s. Um, we established ourselves as part of a heifer project in 2005. That's when we first got our support to really organize. And the farmers um, organized, and mainly these far this was Hmong farmers. Okay, so um, the next part of, um, of this presentation is going to be a lot more pictures and a lot less talking. So, Glenn, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Ooh. <laughs> All right. So I am going to go quick because a picture says a thousand words, and I really want to, want to show you um, who the farmers are and... And, you know, um, this is spider plant. This is Veronica holding spider plant. <laughs> and this is Janie Lore um, harvesting for her markets. This, uh, this is our first group of African farmers. This is Fabiola holding your seeds. We're harvesting for the markets. This is James looking. <laughs> James and James grows a lot of lot of food. All right, and this is at the very beginning of, of the year when, when the farmers are plotting out their own plots. They literally plot out their own because there's too many, there's too many plots. We have over 35 acres. And um, so there's a lot of, the, the larger farmers have their land plotted out. They, they, they rent from five, from five to one acres but the smaller, smaller farmers, we have to plot those out every year. And there's always, there's, there's, there are always people, new people coming. At the Flats Mentor Farm, we do not do any outreach. So every year we don't go out and say, oh, we have land, we have this, we don't have, we have that. We don't have because most of the time we don't have any consistent funding to run any programs. But what we do is we do not turn anybody away that wants to farm. If somebody says, I want to farm, I want, can I have a piece of land? We say yes. Now how much more than that we have depends on the year. So these are the African farmers. This is a group, a group of Hmong farmers on our brand new tractor. And um, again, farmers on the, you know, trying to plot out the land. Okay. <clears throat> Glenn had said some, a little bit about uh, the high tunnels that we have. We participated in uh, a FSA, USDA, uh, actually NRCS, high tunnel project. And the first year out, and the Hmong farmers had eight of the 17 high tunnels that went into Massachusetts. So the Hmong farmers had eight. And so we actually, um, this is part of the training on how to uh, construct one. We had them all constructed from a professional. And he was telling you how, you know, he, he came down, get, did a presentation, but this was all professionally constructed. And right now it's, because I don't have a lot of pictures, you know, on the effects of this, but farmers are, are getting into the markets at least two weeks earlier, and they stay in beyond three weeks after. And also they're doing their seedlings. It's really made a remarkable difference for, for the farmers at the, at the flats.
This is a, the inaugural um, high tunnel. And this is the, the, the ninth high tunnel uh, for an, uh, one of the farmers, so ribbon cutting. This is Fabiola in the middle, um, right there, okay. Uh, that's Fabiola. And this is all of the, the NRCS and equip. By the way, um, USDA has been very, very nice to us. We, they've, it's been very, very supportive of all of our farmers and what we do. Um, so unlike any other parts of the country, we have, we have nothing but good things to say about how um, they have been helpful in, a, in for us to acquire nine high tunnels so far. We have nine high tunnels at the flats. And this is Song Wang Yang with um, her veggies. By the way, it's really cold outside <laughs> and she's growing food. Okay, the Flats Mentor Farm has 35 acres of crop production in uh, 2012. We also have drip irrigation and um, uh, uh, overhead irrigation. I'm gonna go real fast because I don't think I have enough time. So um, most, of you, most of you recognize what this is, some of these vegetables. And, and, the, and the Hmong do such a, a beautiful job. Amaranth of all kinds. A lot of hard work. A lot of hard work to keep these. Oh, and by the way, we do not use any uh, herbicides. Everything is by hand. No herbicides. And, and so if you see no weeds, it's because somebody was out there with a hoe. Uh, we do grow water spinach. All our farmers have permits because it's an oxygen sweet, so we need permits. Um, we need, you need a permit to grow water spinach? Yes. Massachusetts, actually, I think it's uh, everywhere. Yeah. We also have a lot of, we over the years did a lot of trainings. Okay, we had Will Allen up to our farm in 2004. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we also have done a lot of, of yes. This, was, this is actually 2004, um, Will and I used to do exchange on, I used to do the marketing and he used to come and do the, the vermicomposting at, at our farm, so we did it, we exchanged um, trainings. Um, also, we do hands-on. Everything that we do, we do hands-on. Um, our farmers really, first of all, we don't have the capacity to do any type of curriculum in the classroom curriculum. So everything is hands-on at the farm and farmers get to learn by doing. So this was a, the, the trying to, um, to see, to evaluate if the Hmong farmers would like to grow under plastic because we had talked about it and they said, oh, no, we don't like it. So um, we, we came in, did it with a machine and voila. <laughs> All of a sudden, everybody liked it. Uh, and what we did is, <clears throat> so we laid it and, and uh, each farmer had three rows to, to plant anything that they'd want and try on that, those three rows. And it was, it was a great success. Very. Actually, but now, the, now what the Hmong farmers are doing, some of it, uh, uh, they're, um, they're doing it by hand, the, plastic, the laying, the plastic laying. I just wanted to make sure, we wanted to evaluate the, the growing under plastic and for the farmers to really get the feel of what, if they liked it or not. And some of them actually um, have, Ha, they're growing under plastic now because we also do drip. We also do drip irrigation. And so, so not only did, <clears throat> did we do the training, uh, again, all hands on. You, you're, um, we also wanted to see if uh, farmers would adopt 
the drip, the drip irrigation system because it saves water. And, and we have to provide that and show them. Because if, if you don't show farmers how it works, why is it important? Does it really work? You know, farmers are the, most, the smartest people in the world, you know. Um, they, but you have, to, you, you have to show them, does it make sense? And also, so we actually showed farmers how to install and how to repair, okay? And so everybody learned. This is a, a the, he's, a, he's a, a farmer, he's also a farmer, no, not with us, but on, on like five miles away, and he came and did the training. And of course, guess who does some of the work? The women. <laughs> the farmers actually did a lot of the installation during the training. This was, you know, because they learned by doing. So we, 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 because it was theirs. This belonged to them. Okay, so by this time they knew how many rows they had and they were installing it themselves. Okay, and then they got to, um, to uh, plant whatever they wanted on their rows. And on this one, we planted transplants. So, also we do, we do trainings on um, equipment. And again, trying to figure out how things work. We have people that come in, the, the, this, this guy sold us the, tr the, the tiller, and he also made sure that we knew how to operate it. We also uh, received a grant from the Massachusetts Society for the Promotion of Agriculture and Heifer International, and the farmers bought a tractor. So this grant was specifically to buy a tractor and um, so the farmers, right now, farmer, there's three farmers that can, can prepare their own land. They're totally independent and they don't have to wait um, for anybody else. They, they operate because they have a tractor. We have, it's shared, but we have a tractor and tillers and all of the implements necessary. Um, so every, all farmers who are certified to to um, operate the, um, the tractor and not just the men. We also have women that can operate the tractor, me being one. <laughs> women can operate machinery, they can. Um, <laughs> not only am I an example, because I operate every piece of machinery that's in my farm along with my husband, but uh, also Janie, uh, Janie can, uh, can, can run this tractor just as well as anybody else. Doesn't she look good? <laughs> yes. <Yeah, she laughs> Serious. Okay, so um, I'm just going through. This is this is during our trainings. Um, we have trainings on the farm in, in in pest management, weed management. We're not certified organic, but we do not like to use any um, uh, chemicals. So we use organic practices. We in, in the in the in the summer, if there's any issue, we meet on the farm. And guess what? We also, you know, during our events, um, if we don't have a, a, one of those fancy schmancy um, uh, barbecues, oh man, this is the best way to cook. Right on the fire. And during our events, that's what happens. Um, we also build our own. Um, have built our own hoop houses, and all of the we, during your training, all of the farmers help. So, um, and after we work, we like to uh, celebrate. So, after after dinner, we celebrate, and that's one of the things that I like doing during our our events. Um, there's always dance afterwards, and everybody shares their own cultural dance. I've been known to share mine. <laughs> okay, so the crops, real fast. So this is the list of the crops that we have, okay? 
I'm going to go through quickly because you guys know some of these. This is your law. It's not familiar with to, to the to probably it's it's um, probably people here. Um, it's a Brazilian eggplant, very popular in the Hmong. I growing it to the markets. So the farmers have learned to assess the market. It's not what you like to grow, but what you can grow to sell in the markets. Okay, this is Chipoline. Again, not, a, not a, an Asian vegetable, but it sells well in the markets. This is spider plant. Pea tendrils are very, very popular in the markets and in, in, in our farmers do very well. Pumpkin vines, pea tendrils, pea tendrils, pea shoots, okay? It's, it's one of our best money makers in the markets. By the way, when I say ours, each farmer operates his or her farm independently, independently. I'm just there to kind of look around. <laughs> okay. These are some of the things we, that farmers take to the markets. So the flats, we try to provide as much marketing help as possible. Farmers already know exactly how to grow these fresh. I can, you know, the, the, all of you in this room can teach how to grow vegetables and how to farm. You actually can teach the rest of us. Sometimes it's the marketing that's lacking. And we go to Whole Foods. And so if you look at the very top, oops, right here, right here, the top, this is pictures of our farm and of our farmers. And all of these other than, other than this, this right here, came from the flats mentor farm. So Whole Foods, they, they, they used a picture to sell, but we, they also bought our crops, okay? So Chinese broccoli, it, was, it says from the flats mentor farm right here, uh, right there. And they, they took a pallet of of vegetables uh, twice a week. That's what we sold. Okay, the presentation is very, very, very important, guys. Presentation, presentation, presentation. Okay, um, in 2012, we're going to over 30 farmers markets in Massachusetts and all of these cities. And it's very, very important that farmers teach their children how to, um, to sell at the markets, and this is, I'm going to go through these faster. These are just examples of farmers markets. Look how fresh this, this stuff is. I mean, who wouldn't want to buy it? Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little story about th this. This happened um, like six years ago, but um, W there was over a thousand dollars taken in in 55 minutes because this community is mostly Vietnamese and they like their veggies. And they f it was fast, it was fast and furious. <laughs> it was, it was, it, the, by the way, with th this table, after this picture was, was taken, it fell over because there was so many people right here trying to, trying to buy it and trying to get ahead of each other. So, so this, see, this is what happened. It was that crazy. And this was the, the farmer, this is Chai, I think this woman now is in California. Again, same market. And people are fighting, fighting for the, for the veggies. <laughs> Don't forget. <laughs> Now it's a lot more calmer, you know. So here again, it's, this is a, a different market. The people stay in line. 
be, uh, for some of these vegetables because we have done the market assessments. We have, we have uh, identified what vegetable is popular in what community and the farmers grow specifically for that community. That's what we do. Again, there's a line of people for this particular right here, uh, vegetable. Okay, and there's, there's new trying to make sure that, that everybody gets in and out quickly. There's our farmers in the back right there. This is mashishi. It's a, again a Brazilian cucumber. That's it's been grown. It's it wasn't grown by the Hmong before. Abobra again right here. Uh, uh, another another um, vegetable that's not popular um, with the, with the Asians. Right here is we do farmer to farmer mentoring. So the farmers who already know how to market. Are, are encouraged and they do this, they teach their other fellow farmers. These are farmers who are learning from new, from new right here. And this is, again, Gas Schumacher when, uh, I think, 10 years later. This is 2002 when I started with, um, I helped, the first farmer who I helped at the markets was Chai Yang, who, pa who passed, no longer with us, very good friend of mine. That's it.